Second, division of the legislative power. A division of the three powers is then to assure our liberty. Let us apply that theory and seek for the equilibrium of those powers. We shall find ourselves stopped by the immense preponderance of one of the two. What equilibrium can be established between him who makes the laws and those who execute them? That which is out of all proportion can never be put in proportion except in being weakened. That is to say, by being divided. It is then the great power, the soul, which vigorously merits the name. It is a legislative power which should be divided to avoid despotism. And here we are brought by the application to separate the formation of the laws of their sanction. Here we are brought to the necessity of the two chambers. Third, elective chamber, universal suffrage, direct and indirect popular censure, all societies composed of individuals who are proprietors and others who are not. It carries then with itself two opposite wants, that of movement and that of stability. Those who find themselves well off desire to remain as they are. Those who are bad off desire to change their position. That double state of humanity, such as God has made it, exacts imperiously the same state in the legislation. One of the two chambers representative of the movement ought to be elective and frequently renewed. The other chamber representative of stability ought to be immovable. To the first belongs the proposition and the compiling of the projects of law. To the second belongs the sanction or the rejection of those projects. These two chambers, to constitute a good government, should be equally powerful, and each of them to be powerful should lean upon its principle and be endowed with all the strength divided from it. The elective principle being that the chamber of the movement, let us examine this principle for the exercise of the rights of each ought not to be limited but for the general interest and all the members of a society possess in principle the same rights the universal suffrage is then the rule and the restriction to that rule can only be the exception that exception would be then tyrannical if it is not indispensable for every man may usefully without inconvenience and without difficulty vote in his primary assembly to choose the public functionaries of his commune. Those functions touch very nearly the interests, the welfare, and the safety of each inhabitant, rich or poor. Those inhabitants all know one another. They are then capable of choosing among them those who merit their confidence. They should all then cooperate in this choice. The universal suffrage direct in the commune is then just and suitable, and there is no reasonable motive for depriving anyone whatever. Besides that justice of universal suffrage is felt by all since the periodical papers have carried the declarations of the rights of man and of the citizens even to the lowest ranks of the non-proprietors. In our social state, many then may still be in want of bread, but no one can be in want of political element to irritate his hunger. The accession, therefore, to the affairs of the country has become a necessity of our epic, and as long as that necessity is not satisfied, the revolution will not be appeased. The human mind marches towards this end, and it will attain it in spite of all the obstacles that consideration of the fact is still more decisive for the legislator than the evidence of the right. The political emancipation having become a universal instinct, if they feel a repugnance for it, they must resign themselves if they wish to reconstitute something durable, if not to the irresistible interrogation of what is the third estate will soon succeed that interrogation, not less irresistible. But what is the non-proprietor? 